Welcome back to Carnities.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Four Weeks of Famous Philosophers. In this video, we're going to be looking at Immanuel Kant, uniter of rationalism and empiricism, creator of the categorical imperative, and the greatest modern philosopher. Now, Immanuel Kant was arguably the most important philosopher of the modern era. Through all of history, only Plato and Aristotle had more influence. Kant made significant advances in ethics and metaphysics. His transcendental idealism was credited by some with resolving the disagreement between the empiricists and the rationalists that had dominated philosophical discourse for centuries. His categorical imperative is still considered to be one of the three principal ethical theories that are studied to this day. Kant set the stage for much of the philosophy of the next two centuries. He attempted to solve a lot of the problems that had plagued the early modern era and very much set the stage for what was to come in the next era of philosophy. Now, he was born Immanuel Kant with an E. He changed it later to Immanuel Kant with an I after studying Hebrew in 1724. Kant spent almost every day of his life in his birthplace. Unlike many of the philosophers we've looked at before who traveled around Europe, Kant spent most of his time at home. Though his family was never entirely impoverished, they were simple tradesmen, that were no way really well off. Kant attended college in his hometown, and afterward he did spend time outside of that town as a tutor elsewhere for around six years. But after this period, he returned home where he taught philosophy at the local university for over 40 years before retiring. As a professor, his schedule was miraculously regimented. It is claimed that local women would actually set their clocks by his morning jog. Whether or not that's true is probably, well, let's say I'm skeptical, but the idea was that his way of living was very, very strictly regimented. Philosophers generally, generally divide Kant's life into three periods. His pre-critical period, where his writing focuses on finding a good method to do philosophy. Then we had a silent middle period where he wrote next to nothing, or at least published next to nothing, though he was working on some of his major theories. And finally, the critical period. It's called the critical period because of the names of his books. And it was in that period that he wrote his three major works, the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, and the critique of judgment. The first two are kind of the more important texts that we'll look at. The first one is a lot of his metaphysics. The second one is a lot of his ethics. So let's take a look. In order to understand some of the most important elements of Kant's philosophy, we need to talk about two distinctions in philosophy. The first is a distinction between a priori knowledge and a posteriori knowledge. A priori knowledge is knowledge that can be gained without sense experience. 2 plus 2 equals 4 might be a common piece of a priori knowledge, while a posteriori knowledge or experience is gained through sense experience, such as the sky is blue. The other distinction is between synthetic propositions and analytic propositions. Analytic propositions are those where the meaning of one term is contained in the other. Bachelors are unmarried men. In synthetic propositions, on the other hand, the meaning of one term is not included in the other term. John is a bachelor, for example. For more on these distinctions, if you didn't understand what's going on there, check out my series of videos on philosophical distinctions. Now, you might think that a priori would line up nicely with analytic, and a posteriori would line up nicely with synthetic. But Kant actually is going to challenge this notion. So let's see. Kant is credited by some, at least, with resolving some parts of the debate between empiricists and rationalists. At least, what he did was provide kind of a third option. But in order to understand Kant's signature achievement, we need to first remember an argument offered by David Hume, who, by Kant's own words, woke Kant from his dogmatic slumber. 
Watch my video on Hume if you want more information. But Hume argued that we cannot have knowledge of such things as causality, since our understanding them cannot be either a priori or a posteriori. It can't be a priori, because, for example, I cannot know what a fire will do to a piece of paper without experiencing it. But it can't be a posteriori either, because I can't only through experience know that the paper will always burn. And that kind of goes back to Hume's problem of induction. So this idea of causation, that fire will always cause paper to burn, is something I can't know from without experience, and I can't know from experience, so I can't know it. According to Kant, Hume's mistake was that he assumed that the only kind of a priori knowledge was of analytic propositions, because that's really the argument Hume's making. He's saying that we can't know it a priori because those ideas, the idea of burning something, isn't contained in the concepts of fire and paper. According to Kant, Hume's mistake was that he assumed the only kind of a priori knowledge was of analytic propositions. Kant will claim that we can have a priori synthetic knowledge. According to Kant, such statements as 2 plus 3 equals 5 are synthetic. Nothing about the meaning of 2 and 3 means the same thing as 5, but we can know such statements without experience. So that's a statement that, according to Kant, is a priori, but synthetic. Now, Kant will leverage this notion to attempt to resolve the disagreement between the rationalist and the empiricist. Kant claimed that we are born with synthetic a priori concepts, like number, time, and space, because we don't experience number, we don't experience time, we don't experience space, which we apply to experience. We apply those things to experience, but we must be born with them because we use them and yet never experience them. Unlike Hume, when faced with the possibility that we cannot gain these ideas through experience and that we could not have knowledge without them, Kant claims that we must have had them all along. And this is kind of an argument that we will see offered again in the future called a transcendental argument, basically claiming that we have these things and we use these things, therefore the necessary preconditions for us to use these, those things must be in place. So because we have the notion of space, we have the notion of time, and yet we can't get that from experience, we must have had them to begin with. Now Kant did not fully reject the skepticism of Hume. According to Kant, we can only have knowledge about the world of experiences, or the things we experience. He called it the phenomenological world. But we can't have knowledge about the world as it actually is, or the noumenological world. Finally, we'll touch on Kant's ethics. So Kant's worth in ethics is, was also important and revolutionary. He wanted to find a justification for action that was not based on religion. He was searching for a categorical imperative, not just a hypothetical imperative. This would be some rule that was not just good for doing something, in a hypothetical sense, like a shovel is good for digging holes, but good in itself. Kant wanted this rule to be based in reason itself. Now, Kant arrived at the idea of claiming that an action is good if we can universalize it into a rule without it becoming self-defeating. You shouldn't steal, because if everyone stole, the idea of property would fall apart. It's kind of that old folk wisdom of, well, what if everyone did that? You shouldn't kill, because if everyone killed, then the very idea of living life would fall apart. Um, if it can't be generalized, it is bad. And no, we're not just saying if it's generalized, bad things happen. We're saying if it's generalized, it's kind of in some way self-defeating. But if it can be generalized and continue itself and support itself, then it's good. For example, everyone should keep promises, because if we all did this, the institution of promises would in fact be made stronger, not fall apart. That was Immanuel Kant, uniter of rationalism and empiricism, creator of the categorical imperative, and the greatest modern philosopher. Next up, we're going to be looking at Mary Wollstonecraft, the only female philosopher in this whole series. Watch 
this video and more here at Carnades.org, and watch a new video every single day for the whole month of October on a new famous philosopher. Stay skeptical, everybody.